chapter, uh, Mark chapter 4, verses 30 to 32. Mark 4, 30 to 32. Again, Jesus said, What shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest seed you, you plant in the ground. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants, with such big branches that the birds of the air can perch in its shade. My wife Karen here and I went to the Van Gogh, Van Gogh Alive when it was, when it was here. Anyone else go to that? Um, and there was one saying that was projected onto the wall, which I wanted to share today. Vincent Van Gogh, quote, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Great things are done by a series of small things brought together. So we hope that this might be the start of some small things that together uh, accomplish great things. So with no further ado, let's welcome Peter Stikey. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I can tell you that the trip from Mount Barker, where we live, to here via Lenswood and Cudley Creek takes exactly Second Corinthians. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I got to Littlehampton and decided I didn't want to listen to David Bevan talk about uh, Matt Abraham coming back. So I pulled over and uh, stuck on Second Corinthians. And just when I pulled in, was the finish of Second Corinthians 13, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. What a great way to end a journey and what a great way to begin uh, a gathering such as this. But in, in my listening on the way down, I heard twice St. Paul write to the Corinthians about the deposit or the down payment of the Holy Spirit. And it's a great thing to be reminded of because one of the things that uh, some of us have become increasingly aware of over the years is that there is an orphan spirit operating in the nation of Australia. But we could talk about other nations in the world, but I'm not in other nations right now. We're in Australia. An orphan spirit is a spirit that doesn't know where it's come from. It doesn't know where it's going. So living with a, without a, a secure identity masks insecurity by grabbing everything that it can, living for the now, and uh, basically eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. I've had friends from overseas say that Australia is probably the hardest uh, mission field that they've encountered. The soil here, they say, is impermeable. In other words, it doesn't matter what you pour on it, it rivulets and it runs off somewhere else. It just doesn't seem to sink in, and it doesn't seem as if we can break the crust of the surface. And so we try new programs. We try to uh, better our old programs. We go for... Uh, nicer cafeterias, we go for bigger bands, we go for the latest courses from here and there, and we import them as a kind of cut and paste to try and connect with people. But the problem is that the people we're trying to do with this, they just aren't interested. You know, the old days of having the four spiritual laws and telling people about, you know, here's, here's where we are and here's the chasm, and uh, here's where Jesus is, and we've been separated from him by our sin, but Jesus has built the, the bridge and we draw the cross. Across. That just doesn't cut it anymore in society because society in Australia has no concept of sin. So you start talking to Australians about being sin and being cut off from God. Firstly, they go, who is God? You know, I believe I just get thrown out and rocked with the sheep in the paddock. And uh, what is sin? You can't talk to me about sin. That's my preference. How dare you judge me in my lifestyle like that? And so to start the way we perhaps used to isn't a place for starting anymore. And this orphan spirit has feasted on this like a, like, like, like a, a, a maggot. And, uh, and it just it, it's corrupting society from the inside out. Picketing won't work. Getting people to sign petitions won't work. Uh, decrying the corrupt and perverse generation in which we live won't work because amplifying the negative has never produced a positive. And people say that we're living in the most corrupt times. Well, I love Philippians chapter 2 where St. Paul says, you know, put aside murmuring and arguing. You know, we live in the middle of a corrupt and perverse generation, he said. 
And then he says, yeah, we've got the opportunity to shine like stars in the world. So how do we shine like stars in the world? How, how can we be called to, how can we have the courage of our convictions to serve when, by golly, I think I should be being served, not served. Well, it says in John chapter, three, John chapter 15, verse 3, that Jesus, knowing where he had come from and knowing where he was going, took off his robe and donned the towel of a servant and began to wash his disciples' feet. Jesus was so secure in his identity as a son. He knew where he had come from. He wasn't an orphan. He knew where he was going. It wasn't into an abyss. It wasn't to be rotting out in the paddock. Secure in the knowledge of where he'd come from and where he was going, he was free, completely free, free enough to serve, free enough to wash feet, free enough to connect with others. And so the answer to this orphan spirit that pervades much of the world and specifically uh, our country of Australia. I find it interesting that Jesus calls the Holy Spirit the promise of the Father. And Acts chapter 1 calls, Jesus says, you know, I'm going to send you the, the, the promise of the Father. And you tie that together with the last verse or last verses of the Old Testament which says that, that God is going to turn the hearts of the fathers towards their children and the hearts of the children towards their fathers. I'm glad you're here today. But if you're here today to see that microchurch is maybe the latest thing, it's the new new program, well, we're in for a bit of a rethink because this is a return back to what was promised at the end of the Old Testament and then was taken up in Luke chapter 1 as the Spirit prophesied over Zechariah and Elizabeth that John the Baptist was going to be the one who would take up that mantle. And John the Baptist took up that mantle of being the one who would, uh, you know, the spirit and power of Elijah was going to be on John the Baptist so that the hearts of the fathers could be turned to the children and children to their fathers. As he pointed to Jesus and said, behold the Lamb of God. Yeah, I must decrease, he must increase. So then we see in Luke chapter 3 at Jesus' baptism, uh, three things happen. Firstly, there's an open heaven. By the way, it hasn't been shut up after that because Jesus came and tabernacled among us. He didn't come for a visit and then return. Yeah, heaven isn't opened by the intensity of our praise and worship. Heaven was opened because Jesus came and tented among us full of grace and truth. So heaven was open. Secondly, the spirit testified to what was happening in the form of a dove. And thirdly, the father spoke. And when the father spoke, he spoke three things. Firstly, he said, this is my son. We're not Gnostics. He didn't become his son then. He'd always been the son of the father. But this is the father shouting out to the crowd. Hey, everyone, I want you to see this man. He's my boy. He's my son. And then... Jesus says, the father says over him, he says, I'm so proud of him. Yeah, I'm well pleased with him. That's what the father's saying. Listening to 2 Corinthians, I heard St. Paul say to the, the, the Corinthians, he says, I'm so proud of you. I'm thinking, what, what beautiful language. It's picking up the father over Jesus and his baptism. I'm proud of you. And then thirdly, what I like to say is that the father gave him a nickname, beloved. And so Jesus, then, in the power of the Father's acknowledgement and public declaration, which came before he had done anything, before he had spoken, healed, <coughs> gone to the cross, been raised again, before he had done, the Father spoke his favour over him. Then Jesus goes and calls 12, you and I call them disciples, but Jesus related to them as sons. What do I mean? I'm talking about Isaiah chapter 9 here. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder, and he shall be called mighty God, wonderful counselor, everlasting father, prince of peace. So Isaiah 9 is giving us a picture into a Hebrew worldview and maturity in a Hebrew Jewish culture, that there are three phases of life. You go from being a child, zero to age 12, and your job is to play. 
You may wipe the dishes, you may uh, sweep the floor, but your number one job is to play with other kids, follow mum and dad, and be a kid in the household. You don't, however, as Galatians 4 tells us, have an inheritance. And if you think, man, this guy's speaking fast and he's saying a lot of things, it's usually in one of the books that I've written somewhere. <laughs> You'll have to find out where. And then at the age of 12, through a public ceremony, perhaps like a bar mitzvah, that child is now adopted from within their own gene pool. Adoption for a Hebrew was not outside of the gene pool. You know, if Julie and I adopted someone from Korea, it would be obvious, white person, white person, Asian person. But this is adoption from within your family. They were a junior, and now they get adopted from being a child to being a son. And now your job is not to play, but it's to go and work with mum and to go and work with dad and to learn by apprenticeship, by association, by relationship, how life is in the household. And that can last any period of time. But it was interesting that at the age of 12, it was in the temple when Jesus went from being a child to being a son and mum and dad came back looking for him. And he says, I have to be about the things of my father. I have to be about the things that are on my father's heart. And, of course, when you get adopted through that ceremony, you now get an inheritance. And then you grow by learning, and then the process repeats as you become the father or the mother. Mm. And so when Jesus is baptized at the age of 12, at the age of zero to 12, Jesus, you know, plays, he sweeps Joseph's workshop. At the age of 12, he's hearing from his father. It's a different role for you in life. But then he goes back and grows in favour with God and man in wisdom and in stature. And so there's a period of transition. There's a period of learning. For Saul, now become Paul, that was about 18 years. You know, he was converted, did some amazing miracles, and then was shunted off for his own safety and for learning in the anointed school of the Holy Spirit for about 17 or 18 years until Barnabas came and got him and, uh, and brought him back to Antioch. For Jesus, between age 12 and 30, it's roughly 18 years. And so the father says to everyone, this is my son. And Jesus goes out and calls 12 disciples and becomes their father. I'm not talking their biological father. He fathers them. Everything he receives from his father, he passes on to them. As you know, his favorite uh, saying in John. You know, I only do that which I see the Father doing. And so we see in John chapter 17 at the beginning that beautiful description where, where Jesus prays, Father, I've completed the work that you gave me to do. And we know he's not talking about the cross. He's talking about the 12. These are the ones that I've called out of the world. And we know he's talking about the 12 because the rest of the chapter, he goes on to pray for the 12. That they'll be protected from the world and that they'll be protected from the evil one. And then he says, you know, Father, as you have sent me, so I'm sending them. So the goal, the, um, the way of operating is precisely as the father operates, with a father's heart, releasing sons and daughters who will grow sons and daughters to maturity and release them to grow sons and daughters. And if you do the maths, it will take a lot longer than hiring a hall, getting a stage, getting five of your mates in a band, and having an instant crowd in six months' time. But if you do the maths and realise that patience and perseverance, which is talked about in Romans chapter 15, the God of steadfastness and encouragement, he can do far more in the long term than we can ever dream about in the short term. And so micro church is not a <clears throat> quick fix solution for an Australia-wide problem, but it's actually a spiritual DNA that is planted into our hearts from Father God, who in creation put in the principle of multiplication through relational intimacy and connection, an apostolic mindset rather than a pastoral paradigm. In other words, we are a people who send rather than gather. Jesus is the sent one of the Father, and he sends and he sends people to reproduce in the way that he reproduced himself in his disciples to the point where he says, 
guys, I, I, I have to leave you. It's imperative that I go because the ratio of one to 12 isn't going to cut it. One day there's going to be 7 billion people and one to 12 won't work that way. So I have to leave. But, but hang on a minute. Don't, don't worry. I'm not leaving you as orphans. I'm going to send you the promise of the Father. I'm going to send you the spirit of truth. Now, this isn't the spirit of doctrine. This isn't the spirit of theology. This isn't the spirit of dogma. This is the spirit who testifies to the truth about your identity as a daughter or as a son of a father. This is the spirit who testifies to the truth that no matter what your experience, good or bad, you remain his beloved. Outside of your track record, outside of your IQ, EQ, PQ or whatever, outside of your bank account, you remain his beloved. And the Spirit will speak to us about everything that's on Father's heart. He will testify to you that you have not been given a spirit of slavery to lead you back to fear, but that you've been given the spirit of sonship, the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry out, Abba, Father. God's Spirit testifying, Romans 8, with your spirit that you are a daughter, a son, a joint heir with Jesus, as we also suffer with him. And so the way forward in the kingdom is always by being sent within the context of a family because we have a father God. I've got a chapter in the, um, well, I've got heaps of chapters in the Orange Book. The central chapter of the Orange Book, chapter 7, is about the father's heart of God where I actually talk about how I received the Father's heart and talk about how we can live from the Father's heart and share the Father's heart. Before that, in, uh, I forget what chapter it is, but I, I, I think how I got on this journey, um, some of us, uh, when we tell you, we're a bit late when it came to uh, an, an encounter with the Holy Spirit. We knew about the Holy Spirit. And we knew that the Holy Spirit lived in us because if you read the word, you have the Holy Spirit. But we didn't know about the empowerment of the Holy Spirit for uh, intimacy with the Father and for being sent into the world. And that all changed in 2002. I was tired. I was a senior pastor of a growing large church and I was so tired. I connected with some Lutherans because that's the only people we're allowed to connect with in those days, <laughs> worldwide, who were part of Lutheran Renewal, they were having this conference in Latvia and invited me to attend because they also had a, um, a franchise model. You know, we can find someone in Australia and then we can franchise a renewal of Lutheran Renewal in Australia. So I went over there. I just wanted to spend three days, you know, on the floor in the power of the Holy Spirit. But these guys, they'd spent, they'd spent uh, 40 years on the floor since the, the 70s, when Lutheran Renewal burst out, they'd just discovered that the Holy Spirit is given for global mission. So that invited this guy called Wolfgang Simpson. Yes, I am German. My name is Wolfgang. <laughs> I am a visitor from no one. I bring you greetings from nowhere. <laughs> An interesting character. And he was the speaker. And I was a bit incensed because I just, I just wanted to glow in the Holy Spirit. I've been working hard and... This guy got up to speak and I was a bit reluctant to listen, but he started talking about people who were coming to faith behind the bamboo curtain, behind the iron curtain, but particularly in Southeast Asia. People hiding in chicken coops in Bangladesh to share the good news of Jesus with each other. And the, the way that the good news was being gossiped in the kitchens by the women in India who would then go home and share with their families, who would then go home and share with their families. And he was telling all these stories, and, and I couldn't, my, my heart was quickened. And he was talking about people uh, in Bangladesh who would gather around and lay hands on a couple and send them off to Turkey because they used to be Muslim. And they would go to Turkey to never, never come back to Bang Bangladesh every couple of years on furlough. They would go there to become Turkish citizens to bring the good news of Jesus Christ Amen. to other Muslims in Turkey. And I was listening to all of this, and all of a sudden, Wolfgang broke and started talking about the elephant. 
and uh, that's in a chapter here somewhere. And he said, the elephant is a very large creature. You can see it from a long way off. It's very imposing. It's uh, very consumeristic. It eats not only its food, but the food of, uh, you know, a whole lot of other animals in one day. An empty, a, a, a herd of elements can, can empty uh, a water hole. You can hear them coming from a long way off. He then said, but over a 10-year period, a female elephant will at most have two calves. I thought I started to realize where he was coming from. But he had a great big long pause and he turned around to the whiteboard and he said, there is not enough space on this whiteboard for me to put the number of zeros that would be produced in the same 10-year period by two rabbits. A rabbit, he said, in contrast to an elephant, is not imposing. You can't see it. The only time it's in the spotlight is at night when it's about to be shot. They do most of their work underground through a network of burrows. Over a 10-year period, he said, rabbits can totally change the landscape. In that moment, I realised that I was an elephant. Leading elephant congregation. You know, we had a conference every year. Sometimes we had two conferences a year. People from small country congregations would come to this big city congregation, oh, see God. what we were doing, and then try and go back or go back and try and do what we've been doing. And they're like totally, totally um, ineffective to do a cut and paste. I've never stopped to help our people ask, what would Jesus do? I know that sounds simple and trite, but if we live by what would Jesus do, Jesus lived by what's my father doing? So uh, I went and asked Wolfgang, I said, Wolfgang, I'm on my way to Uganda. What do I do? And Wolfgang said, I have some good friends in Uganda. I've been there a number of times. I said, I've got all my notes prepared. I still, I still knew enough in the Holy Spirit that I had to prepare what he wanted to say. And uh, Wolfgang said, whatever you do in Uganda, he said, look, look for the people who parent their children reasonably well. I didn't have a clue what he meant that visit to you again. Nor the second, nor the third, nor the fourth. The fourth, I did have started to have a clue. You see, if God is a father, and if he wants to restore the hearts of the mothers and fathers to their children and the children to the mothers and fathers, then it takes a parenting heart to be able to do that. I believe that every question anyone has about what life will look like in a micro church community or a simple church or an organic church or a church outside the four walls can be answered by looking at family. Because family is God's design. Family is not only God's design for the uh, human race, but it's God's design for his kingdom in the human race. And so on the last year that I was in Uganda, I had 18 or no, 20 people out bush to do Luke 10 training for house church planters. We had to go out bush because uh, I didn't want them to be in a church building. The, uh, the setting sometimes uh, sets the agenda. And we spent, the, we were going to spend a week together. And the first day I was talking to them about the church and, and they like many of us here in Australia, had absolutely no understanding of, a, no biblical understanding of church. You know, steeple, walls, building, constitution, pastor, salary, that's all they knew. And where did they get that? It didn't matter what village you went in in Uganda, how poor it was, they had two things, uh, mobile phones and somewhere in the village, uh, satellite TV. And they watched two things on satellite TV, English Premier League soccer and Benny Hinn, Joyce Meyer, Brian Houston. You know, that's what they watched. And so that's what they wanted to become. So that was their picture of church. So I went back to the place where we were staying. We wanted to stay out bush with them, but they said, no, 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 you're poor. 
your poor Mazungu bodies wouldn't be able to handle it. So they put us in a hotel, I think, that was worse than the open. <laughs> <laughs> and Julie was sleeping next to me, and I cried out to God, God, we've got five more days of this. They don't know what your church is. What are we going to do? And the Holy Spirit said, the answer is in your suitcase. So uh, like any person, I lay in bed and continue to complain, even though God had spoken. You know, there was a mosquito net, which was great for keeping the cockroaches off. And uh, I kept complaining to God, and he said, Please, Peter, look in your suitcase. Now, just before we'd left home, I was already in the car and I realised uh, I hadn't got any gifts for Noah, who was a layman, who was the president, and I didn't have any gifts for Charles, the only other pastor. So I raced back into my study, had a look, and there were three copies of a book given by Ken Graham. And I grabbed two copies and put them in my suitcase and went, and now I hopped out of bed in this room and opened my suitcase I've been complaining to God. These people didn't know what the church was. And I opened it up, and there's two copies of Rediscovering God's Church by Derek Prince. I grabbed a copy, went back into bed, opened it up, seven pictures of the church from Paul's letter to the Ephesians. It's an assembly or a gathering, an ecclesia. You know, it's a body, and he's the head. It's a, a masterpiece. Uh, we're a masterpiece, the church, and, and he's the, the master craftsman. Uh, it's a mobile temple. It's a, uh, it's a family or a household. He's the father. It's a bride and he's the bridegroom. It's an army and he's the commander in chief. And, and I realized in that moment that none of those images of the church were primarily structural, organizational, denominational, institutional, hierarchical, but they were primarily relational. The rest of the week was fantastic. We looked at Ephesians, and then we went backwards. And that's why I'm telling you the story. Then we went backwards from there to Mark chapter 1. Because, you know, Jesus doesn't use the word church. Well, he uses it twice. But there is a phrase that Jesus uses over 130 times, and it's the word kingdom. Kingdom or kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God. And so Jesus says in, in uh, John chapter in Mark chapter one that he's coming. That you know here's here's the good news: repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news: the kingdom of God is at hand. Now repent. Uh, one one poor translation says, "Turn from your sin." And the problem with that translation is that most people think of sin as moral corruption, rather than sin as being uh, a coup d'etat against God and his kingdom. And the word repent actually means to have a, a rethink, to think in a new way. So Jesus comes and says, you, you know what Caesar's kingdom is about? I want you to have a rethink. I want you to think in a new way about what kingdom is. Because I'm bringing you a, a kingdom that's not like this despotic regime from, from Caesar that you know, but I'm bringing you a kingdom that is good news. And then the rest of the Gospels, Jesus embodies what this kingdom looks like by healing the sick. By going in Luke chapter 4 to the, the downhearted, the, the, the broken, the, uh, the fractured, and pronouncing freedom. Here's the point so that you can piece it together. It's imperative we stop starting with the church. Now, just so that you know what I'm saying, the church is amazing. The church is a glorious bride. The church is a powerful army. The church is a, an integrated body. The church is a, a magnificent masterpiece. The church is a mobile temple. The church is a functional, relational family. But it's not the place we start. It's not the place Jesus started. He didn't come and say, I've come to bring you the church. He said, I've come to bring the kingdom of God. Mm. There is a new king, and it's not Caesar. And it's not the all ordinary. And it's not anything else by which we rate or evaluate society today. But there is a king who comes with a new kingdom, and it's the uncontested rule and reign of Jesus Christ where he is Lord, and what he says paves the way forward. And he calls 12 disciples and goes on an extended three-year camping trip, whereby word and deed, by action and reflection, 
by observation and apprenticeship, he shows them the kingdom and he reveals the kingdom to them. Occasionally he teaches, but most of the time, for the stuff that you don't find in Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, is all the questions that the disciples were asking along the way, all the conversations that were had, all the nuances they saw, all the way he related. And then right at the end, many, many years later, just before he's about to die, in 2 Peter chapter 1, Peter says, I'm about, I'm about to die. That's been revealed to me. I'm, I'm going home soon. But before I go, I want to remind you of these things. Never, ever forget them. Imprint them on your hearts. Never put them out. These are the things you must remember. And then he says this. For we were eyewitnesses of his majestic glory. When we were with him on the mountain. When that voice spoke from heaven. This is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. After three years, that's the one thing that Peter says. Remember, remember, remember. It's all about sonship, which means it's all about the fatherhood of God, which means it's all about reproduction in the kingdom. So how do you reproduce the kingdom? Well, you reproduce the kingdom by getting together in small kingdom communities that do life together, that experience all the one another's in communal living. You love one another. You pray for one another. You bless one another. You serve one another. You encourage one another. You equip one another. You exhort one another. As we carry out the one another's in our homes and in our families and phone conversations and Zooms, we are living in kingdom communities and another name for a kingdom community is a church. I dream of the day where we don't have to add a prefix to it. Simple church, <laughs> organic church, micro church. You know, we do that because we're still, we're still maturing. Uh, what do I mean by that? When our neighbours across the road uh, in the place where we lived up until the beginning of this year, uh, beautiful, beautiful family. We've had we've broken bread with them many times, and uh, they'd say, "Oh, you got anything on tonight?" And I'd say, "Oh, yes, yes. We're meeting for house church at our friend's place." Then we'd go home, and Julie would say to me, "Said, well, why did you say that?" She wasn't being critical. She just wanted to know. And I'd say, "What, what do you mean? What would you say?" And she'd say, I'm going for dinner with some friends. But you see, I was still trying to justify my existence. I was still trying to let neighbours know that you know, we're still doing the thing. But what about the day when every connection is an expression of the body of Christ? Mm. That wherever you go, you are the bride. Wherever you go, you are armed with spiritual armour. And so a part of the, the armour of God and the army of God. That written across your smile is the masterpiece of God. In every gathering, we recognise that we don't have everything, that I'm only a toe and I need a kneecap in order to get from here to there. So I'm part of a body. What about if in every gathering that took place, you know what, you know what would have become real? We would have stopped starting the church. Instead of trying to plant church, build church or grow church, we would be the church. We would be living in this constant 24-7 receptivity from Father's heart to your heart. We would be secure in our identity as sons and daughters and living in the security of our adoption as sons and daughters, we would be seeing his kingdom come and his will be done here on earth as in heaven. One of the things that uh, people ask Julie and I many, many times, what do you do when you get together? Yeah, if I had a dollar for every time I was asked that, I'd be in Scotland somewhere hiking right now. You know, I find it interesting because only occasionally have people said to us, 
What do you and Julie do on date night? To which I say, none of your business. <laughs> what do you do when, Peter and Julie, what do you do when you and your children have dinner together? Hardly everyone asks me that. But people are often saying, oh, when you, when you have your house church, what do you do? Well, my friend Taya here has helped me with that. Just wave your hand, Taya. Taya homeschools. Uh, I've known Taya for a long time. And uh, when Taya was homeschooled, I said to her one day, so, Taya, this was many, many years ago. Taya, what curriculum do you follow? Uh, when do you do maths? When do you, when do, you do English? And with love in her heart, she goes, oh, Peter, <laughs> it's not like we do uh, a thousand student school with four of us at home. This is a totally new way of being. We can be doing maths in the supermarket. I'll take kids with me to the supermarket and the calculator and I'll have the shopping list. She said, all of life is maths. I'm thinking of those poor kids. <laughs> <laughs> All of life is English. All of life is science. But her husband's got a hundred ways to blow up the house, so the kids always like it when Dad does science. <laughs> you know, it's a different way of being. And so micro church, simple church, organic church is not honey, I shrunk the church. <laughs> Some years ago, I was uh, Googling. I was asking the Holy Spirit to, okay, no, no, this isn't bad. I was asking the Holy Spirit to, to monitor my words. Anyway, I was Googling uh, Lutheran house church movements, and I came across a site in America, and it had a video of their house church gathering. I thought, oh, this will be wonderful. And there was a large lounge room that had all the chairs around the side, and people were having coffee and tea, and that was interesting. And then someone clapped their hands like that, and people left the room, and they all came back in with a chair. <laughs> and they put their chairs in the lounge room in rows, and someone bought in a music stand and put it up the front, and someone went and stood behind it, and they all stood up and sang a song, and that was their house church. I'm thinking, oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. <laughs> uh, I don't want to go down a rabbit hole, <laughs> but I'm writing another book, and it was going to be called Adventurous. Now it might be called Wonderful or Wonder or something like that. I've just been writing about worship. And, uh, do you know, part of the problem is that what we, what we often experience as corporate worship today is not associated with the biblical words, not the English word from the 1400s, worship, but from the biblical words of, of, of worship. The first time worship is mentioned in the Bible uh, as in an English translation is when Abraham says to his son Isaac, or the servant, you know, we're going over there to worship on that mountain, and he doesn't grab a guitar and a keyboard, but his worship instruments are some fire, a knife, and some kindling. And the Holy Spirit invites Abraham to lay on the altar. Ah. There is a solution that God had created to the problem that Abraham thought he himself should solve. So what if worship is about laying our dreams on the altar? And, and so we don't gather in a lounge room or in a McDonald's cafe or with twos or threes to have a smaller version of the old. That's starting with the church. You say, what is, what is the kingdom expression? What is Father already doing in this community? What is he already doing in our hearts and lives, and how can we respond to that? I can't remember whether it was you, um, Ken, who sent me that, but for a while there was an email from uh, some, that I subscribed to from some people in America. I think his name was Ron. It was called Open Heaven. Yeah, was it? And I was reading that, and the articles were good, but down the bottom he always had about 10 or 15 links of stories he'd heard from around the world. And that was some of the most fascinating reading. One day I clicked on one of those stories and it was about something that happened in one of the stans. I can't remember if it was Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Afghanistan, but it was in one of them. And this imam of a mosque in a, a small township had been reading in the Quran about the, you know, the prophet Jesus the Christ. And so decided to... Uh, follow the prompting of the Holy Spirit. He didn't know it was the Holy Spirit prompting in finding more about this. And he got himself a copy of the Bible. Well, within a couple of months, he was a follower of Jesus. And so they would gather in their mosque and he would share with the other imams and the other leaders of the mosque about Jesus. And they were converted. They went to the local river by night and they baptized each other. Right? Time out. 
coming back to the story in a minute. This is where much of Western Christianity today would say they should leave the mosque, go down the road, rent a building, call it St Andrews, open it up on a Sunday morning and say, here we are, and then the town could watch their martyrdom the following week. But instead, they stayed in their mosque. And it was a mosque. And it was a mosque where people studied Muhammad. But it was a mosque where everyone who looked beneath the surface knew that Muhammad was a prophet. But Jesus is the great prophet because Jesus is the one who was the way to the Father. He was crucified. But in death, he entrusted himself to the Father who raised him from death. And Jesus is the one who shows us that God is a personal Father. Anathema, the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus and now calling God Abba, Daddy. And so it was business as usual. But pretty soon, the whole town, it was just normal for them. But yeah, yeah, we follow Muhammad, but ah, Jesus, he is the Christ of God. Why? because that's what the Holy Spirit impressed on their hearts. And unless you've lived in that community, unless you've been part of that community, it's not for you to pass a judgment on that community. They were responding to what the Father was calling on them, and they saw a whole community come to know Jesus. You know, that's incarnational practice. It's living as sent ones within their own community. Where were they sent to? They weren't like that Bangladeshi couple who were sent to Turkey. They were sent to the mosque from which they had come. So where are Julie and I sent to? Well, we're sent to the people next door. Always got to be careful when I'm big video. We're sent to uh, a lot of people. No, I won't go down that path. Yeah. Yes, I will. No. <laughs> One of the things I recognise is that I can't go on this journey alone. Uh, the orphan spirit that is prevalent in Australia is a strong spirit. And I need, not as in I'm a needy person, but I need other people to be on this journey with me. And I need to be on this journey with other people. Those other people are my brothers and sisters. And when we gather together, we gather to be sent. So we are, not a, we are not a gathering community that is occasionally sent. We are, we are a sent community that gathers to enable us, equip us, and encourage us in our sending. So what equipping happens in... The group that I'm a part of, the one another is. Because when we grow into the mindset of having a kingdom shaped church rather than a church shaped kingdom, the major equipping is done. The major repentance has taken place. We have been renewed in our mind from starting with the church, with man-made structures, with systems and structures and constitutions and uh, meetings and minutes to relationships where we release people back into the gardens that they've been called to tend. I write about that in my book, Spirited. And by the way, this has got normal chapters, like, you know, half an hour. And these chapters take five minutes or less. But each chapter is part of a section. And there are seven sections. The last sections of each of these are what I call sense sections. Mm. Because a few years ago, I asked the Holy Spirit in January what I should read. Uh, yeah, what do you want me to read? I've got John. So I started reading John's Gospel. Next day, I heard the Holy Spirit said, I want you to notice every time sent is used in John, not just the word sent, but the concept of sent. It's all through it. Even to the ridiculous, it's almost a joke that the pool at which the, uh, the man in John 5 was asked to go and, uh, and, and bathe in Siloam, it means sent. I just find it hilarious. It's everywhere you go. And I realised the other day in writing for this uh, new book that I'm doing that the Greek word erkomai, which means to come, is also the word that means go. It's just which, uh, 
way you structure the verb. So we're not a we're not a gathering community that is occasionally sent. We're a sent community, an apostolic, which is a Greek word apostello to send. We're a sent community that gathers together to encourage one another to go to where we've come from. So in the blue book, Spirited, I talk about how God created the uh, the world. And then he said to Adam and Eve, you know, I want you to tend this world. I want you to look after it. And Adam and Eve go, oh, my, the whole world? How can we care for this world? And then God says, oh, I forgot to tell you. I've placed you in a garden. Oh, we can do that. The way you care for the world, Adam and Eve, is by the way you tend this garden. Secondly, he says to Adam and Eve, I want you to fill this earth and subdue it. What? We've got to fill the whole world? How do we do that? God gives him a wink and a nudge and says, Adam and Eve, go, uh, go get a room. You know, go get intimate. Go make babies. <laughs> so we've each been placed in a garden. In this garden, we practice relational intimacy. We get close to people. We open our we open our hearts. We open our homes. We open our lives. We invite the Zacchaeuses that the Holy Spirit places on our heart into our world. Not the Zacchaeuses in your world. That's in your garden, Roger. But there are Zacchaeuses in my garden. There are women with 12-year-old, 12-year uh, physical issues in my garden, just waiting, waiting to be called daughter. Just like Zacchaeus at the end was called son. So who is in your garden? Get up close to those in your garden. And then what? Exodus chapter 4, verse 1. God, I can't go to those people. Moses, what's in your hand? A staff. Throw it down. It turns into a snake. Pick it up. It turns into a staff. So what's in your hand? This is what you can teach your people. It's easy. You know, who is in your garden? Who's in your workplace? Who's in your family? This is why I don't go to 15 different cafes, but go to the same cafe. Why? Because whether they know it or not, and they don't, that cafe becomes part of my garden. Just like Cheers, that old sitcom back on TV. No! Get a cafe in Mount Barker. Peter, how are you? It enables relationships to develop. Our neighbours are part of our garden. My family's part of our garden. And then in that garden, you build relationships. You get up close and personal. You can't fill the whole world and subdue it, but you can start with those given. And then we use what's in our hand. At Mount Torrens, for me, it used to be firewood. <clears throat> now it's walking with people. Okay? So we connect with people. And... Uh, Mike will share with you in a minute about how we do that and connect with those uh, through blessing. In the latest book that I'm writing, I'm, I'm writing about the person of peace from Acts chapter 10, uh, Acts chapter 10, Luke chapter 10, and elsewhere in the Gospels and Acts with the principle of you reach the one to reach the many. And uh, you reach the one who is the entry point into the community, who then in turn reaches the many, who then in turn reaches the many. And so God has built into us a, a DNA of multiplication. And I talk about that in the chapter here on, on church's family. I said earlier that I believe every question you've got about micro church, simple church, organic church can be asked, asked by the answered by the question, what does that look like in family? So 10 years ago, people would say to us, you know, what, what do you do in house church? I said, well, what do you do in family? We gather, we love one another. Oh, you probably don't have leaders, do you? So, well, we certainly do have leaders. We just don't call them leaders. We call them mum and dad. Well, we don't call them mum and dad, but we relate to them as a mum and dad. We have spiritual fathers and mothers. And this is what Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians. He says, you know, by this time you've got many thousand guardians or tutors, but you don't have any fathers. So I became your father through the gospel. Then he goes on to say, he says, I can't come to you, but I'm sending Timothy to you. And what's he saying? He's saying, look, I know you want me to come, but when you get Timothy, you get me. Why? Because Timothy's my spiritual son. Everything that I've got, I've given to Timothy. That's what happens in family. And so we don't have leaders. We have people with a parent's heart, with a mother's heart and a father heart, and their job is to grow other people from childhood to sonship and daughtership. To parenthood. 
You know, when I go to the, the Christmas pageant with my three-year-old granddaughter, I don't say, now, Freya, stand really, really still, please, and then climb on her shoulders so I can get a better view. I put Freya on my shoulders so that she can see. I've had my turn. And then usually I end up with ice cream in my hair and down the face, and I can't see a thing. But as long as Freya sees, I've done my job. Why? Because knowing where I've come from and knowing where I'm going, I'm secure in my sonship and my calling to be able to release the next generation into their daughtership, their sonship, their calling. And as this reproduction takes place, multiplication takes place, and we can truly see, even in a country with an orphan spirit, the glory of God cover Australia as the water covers the seas. It probably won't happen by the end of this year. But it will take a new generation. You know, I wrote in here about uh, my friend Gometrius Desta Buba, whose father was a bishop in the Makani Yezu Lutheran Church in Ethiopia when in the 1970s a Marxist regime came in, killed the bishops, imprisoned the pastors, outlawed Christianity and took over the uh, places of worship as their offices. The people of God just went underground like rabbits. At the beginning of the 20-year Marxist rule, the Makani Yezu Church was 2 million strong. It came out 20 years later, 20 million strong. That's what happens when an army of ordinary people are released. When those of us in official leadership positions can lift the lid on leadership and get out of the way and release other people into their calling, not under us, but alongside of us. With an apostolic paradigm that's always sending. And in this apostolic and prophetic foundation, as my friend Neil Cole said many, many years ago, he said, for every apostolic and prophetic foundation, you will need hundreds and hundreds of shepherds and teachers, people who can care for one another, people who can teach. It. And this isn't teaching like I'm doing now. This is teaching like a mum or dad does with a 17-year-old kid who all of a sudden sits in the seat in the car that's been yours for 15, 16 years. You know that strange moment where you get out of the driver's seat and they hop in and you bunny hop your way into a, a stressful six months? Yeah, that's what teaching is. It's alongside. It's giving up and handing over so they experience. We don't teach everything we know and then release them. We don't train and then release. We train by release, which means... Like in a family, we allow people to make mistakes. Right now, Emily, age nine, is standing up on the furniture. Unfortunately, she doesn't know how to stand down, sit down again. So she can stand up. Why? Because she's seen other upwardly mobile people in the household. When she sits down, there's usually a crash followed by tears. That's just the way it is in life. So in your micro churches, uh, whatever you're planting, whatever the Holy Spirit's calling you to, it won't be pretty. It'll look messy, a lot like family. It will involve admonishing one another. Now, we never, I'd never, I'd never preached a message about admonishing until I heard Ken Graham talk about it. You know, we don't admonish people from a position of height, but we always admonish by coming alongside from a position of weakness because the goal is always to release. That admonition is never a chance to tear someone down, but it's you sitting in the passenger seat saying to the driver, next time, please put the indicator on a little bit earlier and say, please pull over. We've talked about putting the indicator on earlier. Is there anything that is preventing you from doing oh, Dad, I just can't do five things at the one time. Okay, we'll just practice these things now. That's admonition. It's picking up something and training them for growth so they can go into the future. We do all of these things with one another, but it's going to look messy. I encourage you to stay the journey. Why? Because mums and dads are there for the long haul. Another question people ask us is, uh, you know, how, how do you, how do you uh, multiply these? I say, well, it's not like a small group back in the old days where you've got a small group of 12 and you say, right, you six, you're going there, and you six, you're going there. I go, it's just taken us a couple of years to love one another. It took me 18 months to forgive that person over there. Now you're saying we can't meet. So Julie and I never came along and said, Nicholas and Brianna, you go there. Uh, Camille and Talia, you go over there. We multiply in the long term, not in the short term. You know, you're looking at a man who's got eight grandchildren. I 
can assure you that 35 years ago, Julie and I didn't sit down and work out a strategic plan that said by 2022, eight grandchildren is the goal. No, we fell madly in love with each other and out of intimacy produced some children, gave into those children everything that father had given to us and then they put up their hand and said, you know what? We will always remain connected to your family, but we are now going to be sent by you with your blessing to start our own family. Every year on Boxing Day or the day after, about 40, 30, 30 stikies gather together in my sister's home at Norwood. It's called a stikey family reunion. We reckon once a year is about, about enough. <laughs> Many Sunday afternoons in Mount Barker now, there's a stikey family union, reunion, and it's got about uh, 10 people out. Every day, morning, noon, and evening, and in the middle of the night, there's the union that is Julie and myself, living out of the union in Father's heart. Psalm, give me an undivided heart so that I may fear your name. How does it start off? Um, let's just go with that. Yeah. So as Julie's and my heart is undivided, as it's divided, as we united in heart. So the hearts of our children then become united. Not always. And then it reproduces. Folks, if you're in this room, my prayer is that you're in this room, not in this room, but you're here for the long haul. Uh, maybe you're just inquiring about this journey. That's okay. We want to stay together. We want to stay networked. We want to stay connected mm. so that um, we, can, we can be here for the long haul. It's only people for the long haul uh, that are going to see revival take place in this country, not a revival of the uh, glory days of a church culture in Australia, because I believe we need to bury that quickly, but a revival of heart and mind back to the things of Father. Mm. And revival takes place one life at a time, one heart at a time going over into families, into communities, so that we can be the change that we want to see. Um, just one final thing about, uh, about the books. Uh, they're available from the table out there. They're $20 each. All four today for $60. If you haven't got the money, just take them. Um, there's a, a, a slip there, which you can take with them, which has got my bank details on them. If you can't afford them, please take them for free. Uh, this is an honesty thing. Um, Julie and I haven't received a salary since 2009. This is one way the Father resources us. It's not the only way, thankfully. Uh, you don't sell any Christian books. Uh, but I believe these ones, these ones here are good for people who are wanting to be involved in the thinking through what this looks like. Uh, these ones are inspirational for any people. In, in the back half of this one, on the freedom journey, we actually talk about what does it mean when we meet together, how we break bread together, uh, what's empowerment look like as opposed to delegation. So have a look. If you don't take any, that's fine. But uh, there is a resource for you.